Welcome to this second lecture in the series Seven Months, Seven Universities. This is a series of lectures organized by the Action Line 4 of the Arcus Alliance. Uh, the Arcus Alliance uh, consists of seven partners, seven universities, and in the seventh first month of this year, we will be presenting lectures from all partners' universities. The Action Line 4 has a sub-action line, which is number 48, and it's called the Multilingual and Multicultural University. I will moderate this section, and the lecture today will take us to Lithuania, to the University of Vilnius, and I will now give the floor, or in this case, the screen, to Roma Krauchunene, who will present the speaker of today. Please, Roma. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Asa, for this introduction. Uh, so I am Roma Kriuciunene. I am in charge of uh, the Arcos uh, Alliance Action Line Multilingual and Multicultural University at Vilnius University. And uh, just before the lecture starts, I would like to say a few words about Lithuania, about Vilnius University, and our lecturer Inga Hilbig today. So Lithuania's uh, population is 2.8 million, although well, over 4 million speakers, uh, well, uh, use the Lithuanian language in the world. So our capital is Vilnius. Uh, so language, Lithuanian, neighboring states, Latvia, Belarus, Poland, and Russia. What we are famous for? So we are famous for high-speed internet, scientific laser production, and very old and complicated language. And you will hear about that uh, in a few minutes in Inga's lecture. Now, Vilnius University, it was founded in 1579, and it is number one university in Lithuania. So we have 182 study programs, BA and MA and doctoral study programs. We have over 22,000 students, about uh, 2,000 uh, of them are international students. We are quite uh, high in QS ratings uh, in the range uh, of 200 to, in linguistics uh, to 450 in other, in other uh, subject areas. So now, uh, well, Dr. Inga Hilbig, our lecturer today. So she is a research assistant at the Department of Lithuanian Studies, Institute of Applied Linguistics of the Faculty of Philology of Vilnius University. Her research interests are sociolinguistics of childhood uh, bilingualism, linguistic impoliteness, politeness, and cross-cultural communication. She teaches Lithuanian as a foreign language, offers a course, Lithuania and Lithuanians Today, Sociocultural Matters, introductory lectures for exchange students, and is passionate speaking about Lithuanians' day-to-day -day life culture on various other occasions as well. Just to give an example, she has recently participated in our Lithuanian radio talk show where she expressed her genuine passion for her work, teaching the Lithuanian language and culture to Erasmus and international students on all those who are interested in learning Lithuanian and about Lithuania. I hope that many of you will have a possibility to attending those lectures live uh, or once the COVID-19 pandemic is over and we return to our normal educational settings on site, not online. Without many much more ado, I give floor uh, and screen to Dr. Inga Hilbe. So the floor is yours, Inga. Good luck. Thank you very much, dear Roma. Thank you for your introduction. Um, and I would like to start immediately, actually, with what I have for you today. Yeah, so, um, first of all, let's start by defining what I'm going to mean when I say culture today, because this concept is approached in different ways in different humanitarian and social sciences. So it would be nice to give a few um, remarks on, on, on this concept today. 
When people hear, when com common people on the street hear the word culture, as a rule, they tend to associate it with something elite and intellectual, at least here in Lithuania. People think about classical music, literature, fine arts, uh, theater maybe, architecture, things they, they can see in the museums. Um, and all of those things can be put into books, serious books that could be called this way, History of Lithuanian Culture. Um, apart from this, um, people also tend to think about culture um, and um, name uh, traditions, uh, traditional customs, um, um, traditional handicrafts, um, folk costumes, um, religion, language, and uh, similar things. Um, what is lacking in all those pictures that you see here on your screens is uh, the part of culture that we can call um, communication, right? Uh, the patterns of communication, the patterns of behavior in general. Uh, culture is more than the, the things that I have listed now. It's about our very daily life today. It's um, things we eat for breakfast or for lunch. On your screens, you see the famous Lithuanian shalkybarshe, the pink soup that we're very proud of. Um, it's the way we do our beds in the morning. It's how we converse with, with our colleagues. It's about the way we organize our time and what we do with our hands, let's say, right? And what kind of face expressions are common in what situations in a particular culture. Um, uh, what is more, culture is also about things that people have in the, on their minds. We can define culture as actually everything that people have, do, but also what they think as members of a group or a society, Lithuanian society in this case. There is a very nice um, model of culture, um, an iceberg model of culture, maybe some of you know it already. And what we see in this picture here is that the ideas, beliefs and perceptions part is actually the biggest part of a cultural iceberg. When you step out of an airplane in the International Airport of Vilnius, there are some things that you notice immediately. You see people, you see the way they're dressed, you um, hear the language, although you don't understand it most probably. Uh, you get into a taxi, you can overhear the music, what kind of music taxi driver plays in his car. You can go to some folk dancing performance. You can listen to some classical music concert somewhere. You can try Tsepeliny or Shaltybarshche in some restaurant. And then maybe if you are a bit more attentive, you can already uh, spot things that are, well, under the water, but still quite on the surface. Uh, you can spot uh, what people do with their eyes, how much of contact they, they allow, eye, eye contact with each other. You can see if they gesticulate much or, or uh, little. Uh, but even deeper, uh, there are lots of things that are so very much intangible and not reachable with an open eye. And here we have to deal with different notions, beliefs, concepts, patterns, definitions, ideals, um, and so on. Uh, for example, uh, notion of modesty. Modesty enjoys quite a big value in Lithuanian society still. Um, patterns of handling emotions. Lithuanians do not get too emotional in public, but that's not the case in many other cultures in, in Europe and in the world. Concept, 
concept of beauty defines the way people uh, dress, for example. Yeah, what I forgot to mention that is that um, the things under the water influence very much the top of the iceberg, the tops of the cultural icebergs. Um, there are different notions of logic, uh, ordering of time. There are different courtship practices that people get involved into. Um, yes, so culture is a big thing, right? And there's more that we do not see than what we see, actually. And today I will try to offer us a few glimpses into this underwater part of Lithuanian cultural iceberg, but also we will turn to some very practical things that one needs to know if one wants to feel more or less comfortable among Lithuanians. I would like to present some Lithuanian patterns of behavior, especially communication patterns and thought. I would like to help you to understand Lithuanians a little bit or a little bit better for the ones of you who are familiar with us already. Uh, I would like to help you to understand the region a little bit better because there might be some of you here who are interested in Central Eastern uh, Europe uh, in general, maybe not particularly in Lithuania, but there will be some things said that can apply to the other neighboring countries around us. I would like to increase your awareness of yourself as conditioned by your cultures. We are cultural animals and it's very nice to get aware of this in, when in contact with some other people from other cultural backgrounds. It's, it's very interesting and fascinating indeed. Then I will um, present a list of do's and don'ts in Lithuania uh, with a hope that that will help you to avoid some cultural critical incidents with Lithuanians. And cultural critical incidents are all those uneasy, clumsy, frustrated situations uh, where two people, two participants from different cultures come together into a conversation, into some interaction, and then something bad happens, right? Then that leaves one or maybe even both participants um, confused, angry, maybe unhappy. So it's nice to avoid one of, uh, at least a couple of, of those uh, things. Um, and um, since it's only a bit, a little bit that I'm going to present for you today about Lithuania and Lithuanians, I would like in general to stimulate your curiosity to know more, to learn more about us. I also hope to encourage you to experience us live and personally one day when the pandemic situation allows us to get uh, into a live contact again. Now, generalizing about nations is tricky and not entirely respectable business, even though whole careers are built on it. I'll be making lots of generalizations about Lithuanians as a nation, and that, as you see, is really quite a risky thing, actually, and one can never feel on a safe ground when generalizing about nations and peoples. To speak about Lithuanians more precisely, I would like to offer you Sorry, but this quote from an American anthropologist who lived in Vilnius for a while, uh, lives in Vilnius still actually, he's back. And he said in one of, of the interviews that he gave to our press at the beginning of his stay, all generalizations about Lithuania and Lithuanians are true and false at the same time. So it's not exactly encouraging to do so, but let's try. What about those generalizations? What could we say about them? Well, we could say that they are possible, although really difficult to make. But if we talk about groups of people, if we decide that in general, if we agree that in general, Lithuanians are different from Japanese, Lithuanians are different from Spanish people, hmm? Uh, we need to generalize. We need to try to get to that core of those um, values, beliefs, and perceptions that are characteristic to a particular society. We are all human. We are all unique snowflakes, but we are also cultural animals, as I mentioned before already. And there are many things indeed that tie groups of people together. 
geographical location, history, common history of the country, language or languages, nowadays um, social, political realia. A concept of a national norm does exist. It's difficult to extract it, but it does exist and we need to address it. However, the problems that we have are the following ones. First of all, of course, there are various subcultures within national cultures. Uh, we are predominantly Lithuanians, ethnic Lithuanians, I mean, in, in, in our country, but we are also Polish. We are also Russians. We come from different ethnographical regions of the country and live in different parts of the country. We're men and women. We are old and young, and those generational, generational divisions are especially sharp in our country, actually. We are modern millennials and how many post-Sovietiki, quite a derogatory term, but it's, it's being used. We are more and um, less well-off. We are city dwellers and people that live in rural areas of the country and so on and so forth. So yeah, it makes it complicated to speak about Lithuanianess in general. Some individuals pop out. Some individuals simply do not fit into this national norm because they act in the ways that are different, that are innovative, that are uh, simply not fitting into this national norm. Cultures do change. Cultures are affected by processes of migration or globalization in general. Yeah, having said that, uh, I would like to show one more picture uh, for you uh, to pay our attention to the fact that apart from us being unique and sharing some uh, common universal human things uh, as a human race, uh, there's a part of our collective, of our, sorry, mental programming that is collective and cultural. Culture is a collective, collective thing. In my talk, I will base myself on my research done for my master and PhD thesis. The first one was on social cultural problems uh, of foreigners learning Lithuanian as a foreign language in Lithuania. And the, the latter is, was on Lithuanian linguistic politeness. I will also lean myself on my uh, experience of teaching foreigners Lithuanian language and culture. And yes, Roma mentioned in the beginning, I'm really passionate about this, what I, what I do. Um, there were lots of discussions with foreigners and Lithuanians about Lithuanians that I've had throughout all those years in which I'm interested in the matter. So it's also a, a very important and rich source for information for me. Of course, there are lots of books, articles, interviews, quotes, posts and podcasts that um, also contributed to the material. And my observation and introspection is also something that I value actually. And uh, those uh, foreign people whom I had a chance to talk to and uh, interact with, uh, let me gain a kind of outsider's perspective to my own culture. And that was very precious as well. Uh, there will be no absolute truth that I'm going to voice. I need to take this, this precaution and to tell you that there will be things that are kind of subjective. I do not pretend to be objective all way along. So let's take this glimpse under the waterline of Lithuanian cultural iceberg. Let me share you a few things that I think to be typical about the ways Lithuanians think and feel today. We have this country on a crossroad feeling between the north and the south, between the east and the west. Uh, we are classified as a northern country by UN and um, 
we're very happy with that because we have ambitions to become a northern and Nordic European country. But we are called Baltic Arabs by Estonians and Latvians, as far as I know. Uh, this geographical position that we have today was a curse in the flow of history. Um, foreign armies marching forwards and backwards through our land. But nowadays we enjoy it and use it for logistics, for example. Uh, we are society in its adolescence. We can state it like this. Uh, we are quite, uh, mm, uh, we're we not that young anymore, but still we're a young democracy. We, uh, we have many features that are very typical for teenagers, actually. We can compare uh, Lithuania to a teenager. And the things I mean are the following ones. We have lots of identity questions. We are inclined on going to extremes. We um, have some insecurities. At the same time, we are energetic, we are ambitious, we are thriving, we are willing to take risks. Um, while also being uh, very much preoccupied with what other think about us, what do other people, other, other countries uh, think about us and how they see us. A complex of a small country is also uh, something that we need to mention. A complex of a small, maybe I could add post-Soviet country as well, a kind of a civilizational inferiority complex that we have when looking to the West um, with all that orientation that we have to the West. At the same time, we're proud of many things indeed. Our ancient, very conservative, uh, language, our ethnic culture, um, the fact that we were able as a nation, as a state, to rise from the ashes many times in history, to recreate our statehood, to recreate our independence, to seize a historical opportunity and to break out of the Soviet Union in 1990. Um, we are proud of what we managed to achieve in those 30 years of independence. We are happy with what we do and how we are getting mature, how we are getting more and more self-confident, how we're getting healthier as a society that experienced the deep cultural trauma in the past. Yeah, high-speed internet is also one of those things huh, that we are proud um, of. We suffered so long and so much. Um, I use this, this quote um, as um, an example of this victim complex in us, like history didn't treat us well. Yeah, we were suffering, yes. And nowadays, especially we see it in, in young people, there's an ambition for us to catch up for all those lost possibilities that our parents and grandparents didn't have. Uh, to travel, to consume, to taste the world, to take risks, uh, to try something new. We're very, very energetic. We are also very ambitious. We are highly ambitious and achieve a lot. But um, the problem I find is that uh, we do not stop to rejoice enough about what we achieved. So this, this feeling of never ever good enough in us. I think uh, we are gaining this balance, but still there's much to be done to feel self-assured and self-confident and at the same time to accept criticism and self-criticism, to be able to laugh at ourselves at some points. So it's either waving the Lithuanian flag during the basketball matches, basketball is our national sport, by the way, or sometimes saying we're nothing, we're nothing, we're nothing, we're good for nothing. So we are still gaining this balance. What do foreigners really think about Lithuania is very, very important for us. And we are very concerned to provide a good image of the country in, in the world. 
it stems from this insecurity that I mentioned before. Let the world know about us, one of our mottos that could also be um, mentioned here. Lithuanians were always known for not being known at all. Yeah, a fact. <laughs> Watching the Lithuanians, the way we behave, I could state that there's a clear cut division between private and public relationships. It's nothing special. Everywhere and every society, people do differentiate between private and public relations that they have. But in our case, the division is especially vivid because it's expressed in very differentiated communication patterns. As a rule, in public, among strangers, Lithuanians are not that smiley. We are quite stingy with explicit politeness formulas. Uh, our eye contact with strangers is brief. It's so minimalistic. We do not get engaged into small talk. We're quite blunt. And for uh, an untrained uh, air of a foreigner, it might seem that Lithuanians are issuing commands to each other. Um, all the time. Lithuanians are shy and we feel some social dis-ease. Plus, there's a need in us to keep a safe distance from the others. And we are wary of strangers. There are some historical cultural reasons for this. For, for, for this. We're still building trust in each other as a society. Some service encounters are seen as purely transactional and not interactional by Lithuanians. So even uh, at a, uh, well, as a supermarket cashier, uh, the greetings, the thank yous, the um, wishes for to have a nice day is not necessarily a part of a scenario. The staff is trained to uh, do all those things, but if you observe the customers, you can see that it's not needed. I buy my bread. I don't need your hellos and your thank yous, actually. Uh, it's, it's transaction. There's no uh, something, in, something interpersonal in that. That's how many people see it, to my mind. Um, explicit politeness formulas are seen as redundant in some situations. Uh, many favors from strangers and the closest ones, I mean, family members uh, are taken for granted by Lithuanians. And politeness formulas, explicit politeness formulas are not only um, redundant, they might build a kind of a world, some kind of coldness if they're used among two participants who um, are, let's say, uh, family members to, to lovers or um, otherwise related with each other. We have to bear in mind very much that politeness norms are also cultural and not universal. We are very quick to project our own politeness norms onto other societies and cultures and get frustrated and unhappy and to deem these people for being impolite. But uh, if a society holds something for polite, it is polite from the perspective of, of, that, of that group of people. Of course, these politeness norms can be uh, debatable within one culture. And for example, we really have lots of discussions in Lithuania if we should be more smiley which is with each other, if it's uh, desired or not. Um, yes, I have to... Um, say that smile has a different social function than many Western societies. And if you go and smile to random people on the street, you can get two reactions from people actually. And I put it in those two quotes here. Uh, a person might get a question mark on his face and start looking at you very precisely, trying to figure out if she or he knows you and met you somewhere and does not remember simply. Or people might think, well, aren't you a bit strange? Why are you smiling so silly without an obvious reason, without an obvious reason for Lithuanians? So this smile has a sign, I know you a little, at least a little bit for Lithuanians. 
just for a break, a quote from Lonely Planet. We have wonderful uh, architecture in Lithuania. Our Vilnius Old Town is on UNESCO World Heritage List. Uh, we have very nice wooden architecture our, um, houses as well. But the fact is that most of us live in such blocks of flats, right? But it's not as bad as, as it might seem, right? Um, Lithuanians can sometimes create an impression of being unhappy, cold, even hostile. Yeah, to foreigners, but looks can be very deceptive. There are lots of smiles, heartfeltness and helpfulness once contact is made. Communication with colleagues, friends and acquaintances is uh, full of quite explicit politeness investment. The importance of indirect speech acts of politeness also has to be mentioned here. And I mean here the other ways to say thank you, for example, to a person without saying thank you. Uh, we really uh, do such things a lot. Let's say, say a compliment instead of saying an explicit "achu" thank you to a person. Lithuanians are usually ready to work an extra mile for you. Warming up might take some time, but after breaking the outer shell, Lithuanians open up like flowers. I like this saying very much and I'm thankful for one of my students for this. It's very true. When I mean a nutshell, I mean nutshell because we could say that Lithuanians are a bit like coconuts in some cultures. Let's say Mediterranean cultures or North American culture. People are more like peaches. They are warm. They are the ones who get in contact very quickly. There are smiles, there are just uh, patting on the, on the, on the shoulders. Um, people invite to their homes very quickly each other. But uh, some countries and some cultures are a bit more like coconuts. You need time to crash the outer shell on them. But then once it's broken, you have it all. You become a friend from a capital F for example. So, well, it needs some patience, but uh, this patience is, is rewarding at the end. Lithuanian bubble of space, a space bubble that every individual has around him or her, is of an average size. We might get a bit too close for uh, our even more Nord Nordic neighbors, but we really keep a distance from the perspective of, let's say, Mediterranean people. This bubble of space shrinks dramatically in some public places like buses or markets. Um, we really have relatively large tolerance to the intrusions into one's personal space. I mean, when compared to many Western societies. And this reflects less of concern that we attach to personal privacy. People stand in queues quite close to each other. Well, not nowadays in the, during the pandemic, but overall, yes. Uh, the magic of a Tsipra show in public transport is something funny. Hmm? A Tsipra show means excuse me in Lithuanian. And I say it very often to my students, try it out out, say, at um, you know, in a full bus and see what happens. People really react to such explicit politeness thing very um, much. And they, as I joke, split like the Red Sea in front of Moses to let a person pass by. Maybe it's because it's not overused by, by Lithuanians, actually. My own observation that I keep on getting uh, tested and proved all the time is that acoustic intrusions into one's space are seen as more face threatening, more dangerous than bodily intrusions. And that's why Lithuanians often choose to slightly push a person aside to try to slip by, but not say a word, not say it's a prashol. And they hardly ever ring a bicycle bell. So that's the explanation why 
and the intrigue of my title is faded away now. Let's move now to the do's and don'ts for the, for the um, end of, of my talk. Uh, loud speaking in public pops out in Lithuania. We are quite a quiet nation, so people from more louder countries should uh, bear this in mind in order not to pop out. We avoid uh, longer eye contact with strangers, as it was said already. Do not expect a smile back when you smile to random people in Lithuania. Smile is a nice extra that you get, but it's not something that is obligatory to wear on your face in, in, in many situations. Kisses as greetings are reserved for family, friends, and acquaintances in Lithuania. Men do not kiss other men under no circumstances. They do shake hands. Women, however, stretch their hands first, if at all. There's an written rule of etiquette that if a lady wants her hand to be um, uh, shaked by, by a male individual, she should do that first. She should show an initiative. Otherwise, verbal greetings are enough. Standing up when handshaking is important and very polite in Lithuania. You should do it. When we handshake, we take the mittens and gloves off. Uh, ladies are generally led first through the door. Our boys and young men are taught this from quite early age. And in general, we have quite a lot of kind of all dated courtship practices. Um, mouth must be covered when yawning. For many of you, it might seem something that needs no mentioning, but it's not everywhere like this. It's, it's polite not to have your hands in the pockets when interacting, especially when someone is more important than you and more respected than you in of a higher social status than you are. Deadlines are often, not always, but often deadlines in this country. It's always better to keep to the indicated deadline. People might make allowances for you, but you can never know. So better to mind the deadlines as deadlines. We are quite punctual. It's okay to be five, 10 minutes late for most meetings and events, but not more. Calling or texting a day before an arranged meeting with a Lithuanian is something that is uh, recommended, highly recommended. We're no great planners, so please do not force Lithuanians to plan things too much in advance, as for example, Germans or Swiss people do and frighten Lithuanians, because we love to have some space and some flexibility and who knows what life brings. Uh, let's wait and see. We're not great planners, to my mind. When going for a visit, it's polite to bring something with you. However, no even number of flowers. Uh, it's for funeral. If you bring two roses to your girlfriend, no, it's not a good idea at all. People do not handshake, they do not hug or kiss or wear threshold. It's considered to be bad luck. We are very much like Japanese because we take shoes off once we get inside a home. Men take their caps and hats off once inside and especially at the table. Women do not help themselves to alcohol in a gender mixed company. It's a kind of men's obligation to take care of the glasses of ladies at the table. Girls avoid sitting at a corner of a table. There's a superstition that, yeah, if you sit at the corner of the table, you won't get married for seven long years or maybe never, right? So it, it's very interesting to see how it works very well This with, with very young people still. And um, a girl makes a joke look, I'm sitting at the corner of the table, haha, <laughs> isn't that funny? But still people pay attention to, the, to it. Thanking after meal is important, not only praising a meal when eating, but also afterwards. If a Lithuanian host says, no, no, stay a bit more when you're already uh, ready to leave, it does not always mean that you can stay more. 
um, because we do not always say what you mean, what we mean. We require between the lines reading from each other and from foreigners as well. As a foreigner, be prepared to be treated in a quite a special way in Lithuania. Uh, if you try to praise Lithuanian or Lithuania, expect a denial. As one American lady told me, if you want to say a compliment to Lithuanian, you, are, you have to be prepared to get into a quarrel. You always deny what, what, what people say nice about you. So, uh, well, it stems from our modesty, I think. The recommendation is to restrict yourself from criticizing, especially criticizing severely Lithuanians and Lithuania. It's not meant to say that you should be only praising us or avoiding to say a few critical remarks about us, but beware that we are very sensitive. We are very interested in what foreigners think about us and quite touchy, so please have this in mind. Please dare to take a first step towards Lithuanians. It's so important. We are too shy sometimes to approach you, uh, foreign people, although we might be dying from curiosity and uh, willing to know where you come from and why are you here in, in our country. Please dare to take this first step. It will be rewarded. Uh, a wonderful icebreaker, a wonderful breaker of Lithuanian nutshell is knowing a few words in our language. It's very much uh, recommended to, to know at least a few words, a few phrases. And uh, if you want to pick up some Lithuanian to taste it, I can recommend this website that we developed quite recently. Please check it and see if you can learn some more things about language and also culture from that website. Yeah, so it's more or less all what I prepared for today, for this meeting of ours. Uh, sorry for not getting deeper into all those do's and don'ts and staying on the quite a superficial level but maybe we can expand up on, on some things during our discussion. To finish up, to, um, for the end of it all, I would like to show what um, Louis Strauss has said. And that's uh, about a discovery of others as a discovery of a relationship and not a barrier. All those cultural differences shouldn't be discouraging us from trying to know each other, for building bridges, for building archi towards each other and our cultures. And I hope very much that you can discover Lithuania and Lithuanians for yourselves, the ones who are willing, the ones whose appetite was wet. Mm, today, So I guess I, full, I put a full stop at this point and say achu, which is thank you for being here, for your attention. And I'm ready for your comments and questions. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, um, Inga, for this interesting uh, talk and uh, to show us how the Lithuanians are. And I'm so happy that I now know the answer to the question why Lithuanians never ring a bicycle bell. I have been wondering about that. Let's now, now see if there are any questions or any comments for Inga. Uh, you can put the comments or the, the questions in the YouTube chat. There are someone who is telling us that they are happy to be here. And uh, there are also someone that said Labas and Sveiki. I suppose that is uh, just a comment uh, in Lithuanian. That's a um, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, there are not any questions yet. Um, so I could just start by asking you, um, uh, asking you something. Uh, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm from Norway and we are uh, very alike. 
uh, like cousins or something like that. And um, sometimes when people um, describe a Norwegian person, or if I describe a Norwegian person, it will not always be uh, the same way we see ourselves as other people see us. So what you have presented today, would you say that it is how you see yourself? And is there any discrepancy between the way you see yourself and foreign normally uh, say, uh, see, see you? Mm. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting question. And I've never got this question before, actually. <laughs> I think it's very much mixed. I can't differentiate between those two perspectives. Maybe it's because I'm too much in into those things and I um, simply always tried to make those perspectives meet and to get, to get some kind of a, a middle position, a middle perspective in, on, onto, onto Lithuanians. So it's very hard for me to differentiate. As a, mm. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Um, uh, for instance, I liked very much the metaphor of the peach and the coconut. And as a Norwegian, I think uh, people will sometimes see us as a coconut, but we maybe will consider ourselves as a peach. I don't know. <laughs> um, so uh, there are uh, there are some comments, uh, some thank you in the in the in the chat, but not any specific questions. Mm. Um, Roma, what do you think about uh, this lecture? Do you recognize yourself as a Lithuanian? Oh, yes. So thank you, Inga, very much. I like this lecture a lot. And, and really, you noticed the very many uh, well things and you have, uh, well, really, your research uh, well helped you to have this kind of a very observant eye I say. Mm. So really it helped you a lot to see inside us and, and this is not this is also from inside and from the outside. Mm. And I hope uh, well turning to the point of uh, well I ask a question about how foreigners see us. So perhaps I, I my this is my observation that sometimes they see us in a better light than we uh, treat ourselves. So this is because of this very deep modesty in us. So this is stemming from this modesty. Perhaps this is, I don't know, I, I haven't done this deep research as Inga did. So, but this is my observation like this, but really I enjoyed uh, the lecture a lot and, and really I would like to listen more to your lectures. So I hope that, uh, well, this is uh, what, uh, what our listeners, viewers will feel as well and they will uh, will join you uh, well when the possibility uh, will come. Very much welcome. Do you have any comments to to Roma's uh, comments? <laughs> mm. Roma has noticed very aptly that we are fiendishly good at devaluating ourselves. Actually, we are over modest. We are yeah. Here is, here is a question from George Cairns. Could you say something about Lithuanian sense of humor? I visited Kaunas recently and noticed a, a short of ironical sense of humor, which I thought might be related to the Soviet occupation. Hmm. Thank you very much for this. Uh, the first thing I would like to say here is that we, uh, learn to laugh at ourselves. And that's something that we only started doing recently. I think it's an indication of us getting healthier and more self-assured that we can laugh at ourselves finally, rather than only weeping about our misfortunes, the historical trauma and things like that. Um, during the Soviet years, people uh, developed very many ways to speak indirectly about many things that we they were not allowed to speak um, um, uh, openly about. So maybe what the uh, George right uh, noticed here can be explained by this fact that we are good at some metaphoric language. 
uh, hiding our real thoughts between the lines for the others to decode them. Okay, um, is there any more comments or questions? Um, just uh, wait a second or two uh, if there are uh, something else. If not, uh, I would like to thank you, Inga. And I would also like to, to say uh, that um, um, the next lecture will be announced um, on the ARCUS website and also in the ARCUS newsletter. And you can sign up to the newsletter by following the link that I hope Marina will put in the YouTube chat. Uh, I will also like to thank Marina Fernandez Peña from the University of Granada, as she is the one that makes these lectures appear so smoothly online. Thank you, Marina. Uh, let's see, um, uh, George says, yes, that's what I noticed, saying two things at once. And he also said thank you for the for the answer. So, uh, if there are not any more questions, we will um, say goodbye from now and see you next uh, on the next lecture. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Asa, very much. Thank you, Inga. So goodbye. Thank goodbye. you. Bye bye. Take care.